which the critical theory developed, by which it was almost annihilated, was pushed out of the country, and so on. So it is, um, it is the meeting at Wannsee where the Jewish uh, 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 annihilation was planned and ordered by Heydrich. And this is Heydrich, and this is the other one who has been sentenced there. Eichmann. Eichmann there in Jerusalem, he has been hanged. And uh, it is a movie, a, a documentary, based on a real text. All these officials were forced to burn the stuff, but one of them somehow kept it. And it was found later on, so it is based on a real protocol, which was really to, supposed to be annihilated. Okay, today is our text test day, and um, what we want to do is to uh, look through this thing, and that is our repetition of what we have done now. We just use that test in order to have a discussion what we said and so that we are clear where we are now. And you have two weeks to answer this. Um, and you have two options, as we said. You can either take your part in the three volumes, the manifesto, the first chapter. Each of you has one volume. You can take the first chapter and you can write about this. Uh, that would be half of your assignment. The other one would be to take that critical theorist whom you have chosen for your depth study, that either Hannes or Adorno or whatever you have chosen, and write a short summary about this. Or you can answer seven out of these questions. So either seven out of these questions, or one of these questions is on the depth study. And you can take that one question instead of the seven, and do something about the first volume of the first chapter of the volume we have, or and then a summary of the book which you have chosen, your depth study, whatever that is about form or you know we we said Hannes mainly or, but you can take Cicek too. Um, I don't know if you heard of him. He's a Slovenian from Slovenia, one state of the former uh, Yugoslavia, who. Uh, uh, is connected with the psychoanalyst Lacan, right, in, mm -hmm. in, in Paris. And so he also combines uh, psychoanalysis with Marxism, and uh, as Fromm does, and as uh, the Institute did in Frankfurt, and the, so it's, it's very similar to the Frankfurt thing. And he has become very famous, right, is he still around? Oh, yeah. He's a little bit neurotic, he hops around like a <laughs> little thing there, there somewhere on the, before the microphone. But he has his, in spite of the fact that so hardly nervous, he gets his thoughts together always, mm -hmm. right? He comes to an end there. Okay, here it is. Does everybody have already one? No? Okay. I hope I have one for everybody. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Alex, do you have one already? I do. You have one? You did. Everybody has one. So we have one more for our friend there, right? Uh, did you hear from him? No? Majid? Yeah. No, I haven't heard yeah, so maybe he's sick too. <laughs> okay, sociology, 650 there, 6050, new developments in the Frankfurt School. Our specific thing is pathology of reason and its therapy. Please answer critically seven out of the following 66 questions in essay form. You have the option to concentrate on question number 11. That's not right anymore. I think it may be have another number and write a seven-page report on your depth study with reference to some other questions. Let me see what that is there, which, which question that is. If you find it, you can... Fifteen? Uh, Fifteen. The critical summary? The critical summary of the reading, yeah. Manifesto, it is really, it is sixteen. Sixteen. So let's change that to sixteen. I knew I made a mistake and my printer broke down Oh, this technology drives me nuts. Okay, that is 16 then, right? Number 16, so you can choose 16, either to answer seven questions or just answer this one, this 16 question. <laughs> and write a seven page, but uh, you are not bound to these seven pages. So this, uh, you know, seven pages is only a parallel to these seven there. That means when you answer the questions, you should maybe write one page one and a half page about each uh, question. So then the alternative would be uh, seven pages, but the, the, the quantity is not important. The quality is what counts. Okay, then give a critical summary of the trailer. This is documentary. We saw the trailer here. Does the trailer give any indication?
variations of Adorno, Habermas, Honnesis, uh, Sex. Uh, take them all together, you can take just one of them, right? I just put them together there. But you can concentrate on Hannes or and uh, on Habermas, who was the student of Adorno, and then Sitzek is dependent on them too, of the manifesto in the time which is documented or in the time in which the documentation took place. So what is documented in the documentary? My youth there. So you saw the pictures of Frankfurt being bombed out. It was night. That means the British were there. The Americans bombed in daytime. The British bombed at nighttime. Why that was that way is still not entirely clear to me. That was a division of labor. And of course the city burned down and of course hundreds of thousands of people were killed in this process in all the cities. In the end, almost all German cities were destroyed, 80% or so. When the Frankfurt School went back to Frankfurt, it was 80 to 90%. They had only not bombed out the railroad station, because when they came in, they wanted to still to travel by train, and they had not bombed out the Frankfurt, the main Frankfurt Hotel, the Frankfurter Hof, because they wanted to live in there, and then the IG building, because they wanted to make that their government seat. Everything else they had bombed out. So when they bombed, they planned exactly what they would do afterwards. They did not bomb Heidelberg because they wanted to have a government station there too. And the American Air Force uh, generals all had girlfriends in Heidelberg. They studied in Heidelberg. They didn't want to fight in Heidelberg. So when I was defending Mannheim, which is the 30 miles away, I always went to vacation to Heidelberg because instinctively I thought they will not bomb their, f their former lovers and so on. So, and I was right. I could always sleep nicely in Heidelberg and hear the bombardments of Mannheim there. But never a bomb fell in Heidelberg. So the war is a very, very strange thing. <coughs> okay, so that is the background. Now for us, it's interesting, you know, that of course I didn't know anything when I grew up about the Frankfurt School. It was called the Kaffee, Kaffee Marx. It was called in popular language so on in, in Frankfurt. But uh, I grew up, I was born and grew up about 10 minutes walk away from, from that institute. So strangely enough, it was in my past. And uh, it was in the west side of Frankfurt, so I grew up in the proletarian way. So we have the, the third estate is the bourgeoisie. Fourth estate are the workers. So we have here 200 million workers, and then we have a bourgeoisie here. The little bourgeoisie, the shopkeepers then the, uh, uh, the, the people, the, the Pfizer's, the middle bourgeoisie, then you have the high bourgeoisie, the Carnegie, the Rockefellers, and so on. They rule the country, the oil guys, and so on. So um, that is the difference between the third and the fourth estate. Where's the first and the second one? Well, they were guillotined, so the, and they disappeared. Now, you still have a little queen in Holland, and her son will now take over, so you live there. But all these English or Swedish or Norwegian or um, uh, kings, they're all constitutional monarchs. I mean, they have nothing to say. They're just paid for decoration on the cake or whatever. It's, it's a symbol of the country's unity or so, but otherwise they're powerless. That is why our American revolution was not a revolution. Revolution means to remove an estate, the first or the second. That happened in the French Revolution, the British Revolution, but here, we didn't remove anything. George was had already been removed. He was already a constitutional monarch who has nothing to say. What our conflict was about was the Boston bourgeoisie and the Manchester and London bourgeoisie. Our bourgeoisie wanted to sit in Parliament and make laws, and if they don't are able to make laws, they were not able to make laws because the colonial bourgeoisie was kept down, then they wouldn't pay any taxes. That is what the conflict was about and nothing else. It was not a revolution. And they didn't call it a revolution. It was called a revolution the first time in 1800. That was decades after the war had, the war had taken place. Okay, that, that's just the sideline, right? <coughs> and um, so the, um, uh, I think I, the, oh, you can bring that together with the story which I told you. So um, the, the, I went to an elite uh, high school, the Lessing Gymnasium, and uh, I was a tiny little proletarian guy there, and I told you the story and about the Jewish woman who came also from that. So there was a poor Jewish woman, and uh, so it's the poor Jews who were put into those camps, and the rich guys, like uh, the, uh, the uh, Rothschild. Rothschild is the banker who became a banker in Frankfurt. He 
had a store, a little bank in the old city which was bombed out, and from there it grew and grew and grew all and today they are all sitting in in the uh, in Paris so and in new york when when Hitler said you know that if the Jewish high finance he meant Rothschild, Rothschild, he meant Rothschild. Um, I grew up in that Rothschild thing. There were huge palaces were there, and he had given a whole huge Palmen garden, uh, garden for esoteric, uh, esoteric plants and trees and all that, and a zoo and so on. So he was, uh, how do we call that? Uh, philanthropist. He was a philanthropist. That's so very closely related to this capital thing. So and and Hitler and many others. Uh, blamed them because they had made money in the 1870 war, they had paid for that war, and they had paid for the First World War, and in spite of the fact that the first one was victorious, the second one was lost, they still made a tremendous profit, and so um, the Jews were blamed, this high finance was blamed for, for these wars and the losses of the wars, and so they brought, the fascists brought together two people, the communists in Moscow, and the and the uh, uh, Jewish uh, high finance, there were Jews in Moscow who made the revolution there. There, there was an anarchist too in the movie there, uh, Dr. Chivago. You see an anarchist uh, version of socialism, but uh, there were a lot of Jews involved there. So they brought that together and said that the Jews are behind the bankers and the Jews are behind uh, the, the the communists as well. And both of them wanted to kill them, uh, the, the Aryan people, the Europeans, uh, and, and it was the, the, the thing of the elders of Zion, the, the protocol, which was their plan. That is how Henry Ford saw it, and you have the volumes here, the International Jew, which is all about this, for Henry Ford, and uh, you have that also with Hitler, they read the same thing. They knew that this protocol of the elders of Zion was fraud by the secret service of the Tsar uh, in Paris. They, they were clear it was, it was written about in the Frankfurt newspaper and Hitler wrote about it and so on. So they were clear, but the Jew had written it anyway. Only a Jew could write something like this. And the protocol says how you, how the Jews penetrate the mass media, how they penetrate the government and so on and so on, and undermine it and get into the porno business and into the drug business and so on and thereby emasculate the masses and one thing is also to drive them into fraternal wars where the Aryans are killing each other. So Hitler read at least five times <coughs> if the um, if this uh, 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 the Jewish high finance Rothschild, if they drive these European nations once more in a war against each other that will not be the end of Europe, it will be the end of the Jewish race and this European war became an international war with Pearl Harbor. At Pearl Harbor, at that time, they met here, because now this time has come. There is no signature of Hitler that he ordered the annihilation of the Jews, but the uh, the Heidrich and, and the SS commandos, they brought together all the government people, including people from Hitler's headquarters in Berlin, and uh, told them that it would be done with Cyclone B from IG Farben and so on, and so that means when Hitler declared war against the United States and uh, J Japan attacked the United States, that is when it became uh, an international, a world war again. And Hitler had tried, you know, to bring England on his side, as sort of has uh, flew to England several times in order to show how much better the British would be off if they would go along with Germany. That Germany would not have a sea power, that this would all belong to England and the United States, that he wanted to have a free hand against uh, communistic Russia, and uh, that uh, that would be his colonial territory, as England had uh, India, and uh, England and France had, uh, had Africa, and we had Central America and South America and the Philippines. And so capitalistic countries need colonies, that is understood, and he would not... He, didn't want to have much anything in Africa anymore, maybe a little bit, but uh, his main interest was to be, uh, and, uh, he couldn't get Churchill around, so he blamed them for it, and he blamed the Jews in London, and the Jews in Paris, and the Jews in New York, you know, and the Jews in Moscow, he blamed them for the Second World War, he didn't in no way feel guilty for it, Th that was, they were responsible. 
Okay, so <coughs> that is the trailer in the background, and uh, it show, shows a little bit how I personally got into this, because we developed then in the last 50 years or so, we developed out of this critical theory of society, the critical theory of religion, which now is moving between New Delhi and uh, St. Petersburg and Tehran and whatever, and we want to continue to work on that, and you are part of this. We, we all participate in this overall discourse with certain different points. So you can look that up at the website again. There you can see, look at the little trailer. Okay, is there any question about the, the trailer there? Okay. Then number two, give a good little summary of the self introduction. So I told you a little bit about my life and uh, the same purpose like the trailer and uh, how this manifesto came about. Um, so that we don't have to go into that any further. Give a critical three, give a critical summary. The first part of Siebert's documentary, uh, that's the first part, and that is the second movie which we saw. I think we saw a very short, some things where I talked about the critical theory, uh, about Marx and the critical theory, and Freud and the critical theory, and we didn't get much further, but um, that uh, I have, if you want to have it, I, I can give it to you. So, so uh, but that is more specific how, how the critical theory uh, of religion came about. That's not so much our theme here. Our theme is more the critical theory of society. So, number four, what is the critical theory of society? Give a short summary of its history and so on. So, um, the one can best describe it in terms of historical thing. There was a little group of Jewish people, three, as a matter of fact, Pollock and Hockheimer and uh, Susan. Susan was her name. Susan was uh, a girl who was related somehow to Hockheimer. And uh, Hockheimer and Pollock had left high school early. Um, they were supposed to get a special education because they were supposed to become CEOs in their parents' factories. Uh, Pollock's factory went to pieces, but the other one Horkheimer's um, factory bloomed. He was a textile guy. Now, that is very important as a background. Jews came from Eastern Europe, and they looked dirty, and they were stinking, and they came into Vienna, and they were hated even by Jews, and so on. But in one generation, they turned themselves around, washed themselves up, got into business, and the Horkheimer's started to collect rags all over the place, and then put these rags together, put chemicals on them, and made them into real, uh, real material again, out of which one could make clothing and so on. These factories were hell. Uh, so near, they had one, they had a factory near Stuttgart and another one near Frankfurt. And uh, first of all, they were unbelievably hot. Then they were these horrible, deadly chemicals, which by which these uh, materials have to be cooked and so on. The workers worked halfway naked and so on. And see, uh, and, and uh, Horkheimer was the CEO in in, near, in the place near Stuttgart, and he observed all that. That means he found out why he had such a good life, why he had such a wonderful house in Stuttgart, why he could travel to England, to Belgium, to France, could learn all these languages, why these poor devils had to cook in this heat there with, together with the material which they uh, uh, transformed and so on. So. What you have is, the first generation comes from the east, climbs up very fast, gets out of the ghetto, climbs up, gets into econ economic industry and so on, becomes in one or two generations very rich, and then suddenly there comes the counter-movement. That means that the sons of the grandsons have a bad conscience about what their fathers did and how they got their money and, and so on. And it was out of this guilt feeling that these three came together and wanted to build that island of happiness. That means they separated themselves from this bourgeois culture, from that wealth, from these beautiful houses. And that's the same thing for Fromm in Frankfurt. Fromm lived in Frankfurt too, and was born in 1900. Adorno too in Frankfurt, they were on the east side of Frankfurt where the rich guys lived and they had businesses and did very well. Uh, so that, uh, but then out of this guilt feeling that, they, that this wealth was achieved through that slave labor and to the, uh, uh, the, the whole basis on which their life <laughs> was blue.
presuming was so unjustly arrived at that part about this group and this group then is could say is the beginning of the critical theory and it was a religious group in, in a certain sense a free thinking religious group and Pollock said that was the only time that Horkheimer tried to do something like this in a religious way later on he didn't do that anymore so well but Pollock you know this question now is questionable the whole thing and my God and Dustin and so on, we have dug into the whole thing. You know, if they were religious in the beginning and if they remained religious. And Horkheimer was still a member of the synagogue in Switzerland when he died. Uh, even Marcuse, who was the most unreligious of them, he uh, gave speeches in the synagogue in in uh, in, in uh, New York and, and so So they had an ambiguous relationship to their Judaism. Uh, they rejected some of it, they also preserved some of it, and in the uh, logic, the Hegelian logic, that means they did not deny their religion abstractly, but rather concretely. That means they did not think it was all stupid, but they preserved something. And we said already what they preserved, namely the second and the third commandment of the Mosaic law, not to make images of the absolute and not to name the absolute. And they connected that with Kant's prohibition against analytical understanding, that means the sciences, to penetrate into the realm of the thing in itself, which means to say something about God, immortality, and freedom. That was the thing. In that sense, they were Kantians, and, and so on. So, but that was the beginning. So, and, the, um, and it was not only the only, only story, Horkheimer uh, also wrote... Uh, expressionistic uh, stories, diaries, novels, and so on. <laughs> and up to the day, the critical theory, and you have a whole list of literature there, uh, where the critical theory is related to uh, to different authors, modern authors, like Thomas Mann and so on, who in their poetry or in their novel writing uh, do the same thing about um, what the theorists do. And Lukacs was very strong in the literary thing, and Adorno too. So um, there is a connection, remained a connection. So, in order to study, you know, the critical theory historically, you can uh, uh, um, theoretically you can read stories by, uh, you know, by by some of these authors which are which are mentioned there. Okay, so um, that is as far as the beginning of the history is concerned, and. Of course, they, all that happened in the liberal society, but they were uh, somehow uh, 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 critical of this liberalism of their parents. Their parents became uh, uh, rich under this liberal system, but they were critical of this um, uh, Jewish liberalism, and uh, they were, of course, from the very beginning, very critical of the fascist beginnings. And here we have to see the following thing. The civil society, a liberal society, what uses is a class antagonism, um, which then is felt as a deep injustice. Out of this injustice develops then socialism. And so in liberal Germany, socialists already under Bismarck became stronger and stronger. And Bismarck, in order to beat them, introduced in 1870 Social Security and health insurance, what we only not even have now, that Obamacare still leaves out 10 million people. The Germans had that already by 1870, and it was introduced by conservative people because they want to take the wind out of the socialists. So the socialists were there, but the um, German uh, bourgeoisie and uh, had connected itself with the nobility. That means the third estate went together with the second estate and the first estate and that was the great disappointment because Marx came to Frankfurt to St. Paul's Cathedral and hoped that the bourgeoisie, the third estate, the fourth estate would go together against the nobility and the clergy and they didn't. Instead of that, the bourgeoisie united itself with the first and the second estate with the princes and the kings and so on and, um, and pushed the fourth estate into socialism and communism but at the same time kept them down and the two wars were helpful to 
came down, but when, this, when the, uh, second, uh, the First World War ended, there was, a, um, there was an upheaval. The socialistic revolutions took place in Hamburg and Munich and then in St. Petersburg and so on. But after the Second World War, the Fourth Estate was totally quiet. The attacks on Hitler uh, took place by the Third Estate and by the First Estate and by the Third Estate like Bonhoeffer. So um, the, uh, the working class, there were individuals who attacked Hitler and they were executed from the Fourth Estate. But the Fourth Estate was completely quiet. Only part, a small part of the bourgeoisie uh, rebelled against him in alliance with officers from the nobility. They sent Stauffenberg. Stauffenberg was a member of the nobility and he had a mayor in in Berlin who was supposed to take over the government it would have become a bourgeois nobility government again with the exclusion of the fourth estate and also their policies are clear they wanted to ally themselves with the west the bourgeois west and wanted to continue their fight against the east against the proletarian east against socialism so since the since the Hitler people there we'll see them there are uh, the uh, low bourgeoisie shopkeepers and so on they are somehow squeezed between the labor unions on one side and the, and the working class and so on, and on the other side the big corporations who kill them off and so on. And so fascism is an attempt of the low bourgeoisie to make a place for itself between the proletariat on one side and the high bourgeoisie on the other side. And somehow in the Second World War the high bourgeoisie decided that the low bourgeois thing was more dangerous for them than the proletarian thing and they hoped that the low bourgeoisie and the proletariat would kill each other off and of course the Germans killed 27 million uh, it doesn't work, the witch isn't there the witch is there yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that was, you know, it, it shows even in the how, how things went there why, you know, that in the end, you know, where Hitler was squeezed to death, so to speak, by the American armies coming from one side and the Russian, particularly the Russian armies on the other side, and they couldn't, in the headquarters of Hitler, they could never make up their mind, you know, if they should go with the East against the West or with the West against the East, and Hitler forbid contact with both of them, but Himmler made contact in Norway and Sweden with the Allies, so he wanted to go to that side. I don't even know if any attempt, uh, a last minute attempt was made uh, after Hitler was dead already to go together with the Russians. It was a German general who spoke um, fluently uh, Russian and he went to the headquarter but the Russians were just cold and uh, uh, did not even think of uh, making an alliance against the West or whatever. And the West and the pattern, General Patton wanted to march back again to Stalingrad uh, that was the American Congress was just tired of the whole thing they didn't want to do. So Hitler's hope that the same thing would have happened to Frederick the Great, namely that the alliance would break apart uh, because the Tsarina died. When, Church, when Roosevelt died, they wrote in the newspaper, the Tsarina has died, now the alliance will fall apart. But the alliance had just been strengthened in, in Yalta, and then the Potsdam Agreement, it was only after that, maybe two or three years later, after Hitler had died, that the alliance then broke down. And then the Cold War came out of this. So here is the historical context which without, we, without which we cannot understand the texts which we are reading, including the Manifesto, but all the other things as well. Okay, so that about the history, and just, uh, and just two more points there. Um, there's then the... Uh, uh, Horkheimer was opposed to take over his father business. He didn't want to do that. So he went and made his Abitur. That means he finished up the uh, high school in Munich together with, uh, with his friend, a lifelong friend, the Frederick Pollock. And uh, then he fell in love with the secretary of his father, who was eight years older than he was, and she was British. And she was Anglican. She was an Aryan. So he married an Aryan. He was a soldier in the German army, but he was too sick in order to get into action, so he was in the hospital in Munich, so, but he was, he was drafted, so he was part of it. And so there was an unbelievable conflict now with the father, uh, old Moritz, Moritz uh, Hockheimer, who wanted his only son to take that whole thing over, and he didn't want to.
and on top of this uh, thought that all what he had done was immoral and stole his secretary who uh, Rika, Rika uh, was her name Maiden, she was usually called Maiden and uh, she, her father had also been uh, an English uh, bourgeois character of the factory but he had made bankrupt, got bankrupt and so she had to work for Horkheimer and then they lived together for some time which was not so usually usually at that time and uh, then when he had to try to begin to his lectures in the Frankfurt University he woke up one night and he said to Maiden you know <laughs> it would be better you know maybe if we get married you know it looks better when I mean, I'm a professor and so on and she said is that all that's why you woke me up that is unbelievable so <laughs> so they were very liberal people but they I don't know if they went to the rabbi or they got the justice of the peace but they were married and it was a beautiful marriage no children for uh, 50 years or more but there was a funny thing the Susan, <laughs> the Susan who was part of this group of the happy island of happiness, um, she dropped out of that happiness because she fell in love with the petit bourgeois fellow in Paris, and so they they felt that it was some kind of betrayal. But when when uh, Horkheimer travelled in Paris after the Second World War, he met her, and Maiden got even jealous after fifty years of marriage. She got still jealous, and she he had to console her and said, you know, we love each other, and so on and so on. So, but he, he met her and she was in a miserable condition. Instead of the island of happiness, he had an island of unbelievable misery in her marriage. There was a guy whom she caught up with up there. <coughs> okay, so um, then the, the, so the 1933, um, Horkheimer's home in the Taunus Mountains, he had a wonderful home there, became an SA headquarter, and the institute was um, was then uh, liquidated, both institutes. So there was a psychoanalytical institute, and there was this Horkheimer uh, social uh, social theory thing. So these two things we have to get together because the critical theory is a combination of Freud and Marx. It's a combination of psychoanalysis and historical materialism, and so it is not. These are not very popular in our culture. So in the Ivy League colleges, yes, but not in the normal culture. So that makes it a little bit difficult that we have to build a bridge to this, to both of them. Uh, so uh, they they started from 13 to 33, and then came the Scatastro University of Frankfurt became fascist overnight. Now, however, that happened is this is quite a question. There was um, there was also there the new school the school of Jewish learning, the Jewish school of learning. Yeah, the Jewish School of Learning. Martin Buber is a specialist for Hasidism and for the Kabbalah and so on. He wrote a lot and he was the leader of this. And the Frankfurt, school, uh, the Frankfurt University had been an entirely economic type of thing, a business school. It was founded in 1914. And then when the war was over, suddenly they wanted to have some kind of a religion department or whatever. And they brought Buber in, and they brought Paul Tillich in, the Protestant Catholic, and then they brought a Catholic in, whose name I always forget. Well, I will get to him if I remember him still. But so that was the situation from 1919 to 1933. So it had bloomed as a university, and these three religions were, were very active on campus, and then it became fascist overnight. But we want to have even an, uh, see the ambiguity of fascism, and it's a, it's just an empty concept for us. I think it's something to be hated, but it's important to know also some determinations in the department. So we said something about spirituality, and they said, "What is spirituality?" It's a very nice Protestant concept originally, and then it had a meaning, but now it's completely empty. What the hell are the determinations? And Steve uh, Covell, he didn't know what I was talking about. I said, we have a lot of these dem empty concepts, you know. And Wittgenstein said these are nonsense sentences, nonsense words and so on. You have to know what the concept is. What is the difference now, spirituality and religion, you know? We know that people who don't want to be religious anymore still want to have something called spirituality. But 
it still has to have some determination in God's name. And there wasn't anything. See, the witch, I told you. <laughs> yeah, I just have to shout loud and, and it happens. <laughs> so, um, nevertheless, the, so we have to see too, they, they became fascist, but they were teachers who, who, let, um, who, who let the Jewish people in the university still do their degrees. So they could finish their studies. They didn't throw them out right away. Dustin has the experience in my lesson gymnasium, right? Mm -hmm. You saw the picture. Tell him. And the picture of all the students um, in those years, in the early years of fascism. And then, it, but some of the students' faces are missing. And it says something like, where have they all gone? Or something like this. But of course, they were all the faces of all the Jewish students yeah, in the lesson right. gymnasium. No. So. And you know, I didn't notice anything of this. So that's, that's the whole terrible thing. So they were one or two, you know, in each class, and suddenly they were not there anymore, and nobody talked about it. It's very spooky. So, but the university did not just eliminate them. So there were some fascist professors who let them go through. So that's a nice thing, which doesn't change the picture, but it is somehow in order to get a plastic picture. Really, they were nice fascists. That is the strange thing. They are also nice communists, you know. So they are nice bourgeois too, you know. One from downtown, a businessman, Todd, he went with me once and he paid $250 in Dubrovnik with a fee for the university and so on. So you, one has to have uh, dialectically, we must look at things dialectically, there are a mixture of positive and negative things in all of them. They are all human beings after all, right? So if somebody makes somebody totally black, you know, it's probably not true. Uh, there is also in the blackest guy there is something you know some uh, something uh, positive still. Yeah. still. And then you have like in thirty three when Heidegger becomes the rector yeah. in uh, in in Heidelberg, and all of a sudden he won't but allow it. It was in where was it? Not in Tübingen. It was in the another place. Marburg? No, not Marburg. It was in the Taunus Mountain. Um, what university is that? It was, um, well, it will come back to me. It was not Heidelberg. Um, it was also not Tübingen, but so close to it. So it uh, doesn't matter. But Husserl was there too. And mm -hmm. and I think he was there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, when he wouldn't allow his doctor father, Husserl, who was Jewish, and Heidegger became the rector of the university and wanted to Nazify the university. Part of it was is that the Jewish professors could no longer use, you know, the university, so they couldn't come to the library or whatnot. This is a great scandal because his, his great book, Sein und Zeit, you know, Being in Time, is dedicated to his doctor father, Herschel, and then he wouldn't allow him to come back because he was Jewish. Yeah. Unbelievable. Right. But then later on, you know, Heidegger said he sent flowers to uh, to the wife of Herschel when they were on vacations in the North Sea Island and he tried to defend himself and of course he had uh, Hannah Arendt you know as a lover and she was, was Jewish so these are very confusing things the top Nazi suddenly has a Jewish lover and that was before the Second World War and then they met again afterwards and the love affair went on you know but something which we also have to see you know the, the confession of these people Heidegger had been a Catholic theologian you know he was supposed to become a Jesuit and uh, then taught theology for a long time before he became a philosopher and wrote this time and being there. Um, so why, why, what was it in them, you know, which drove them to fascism? That is a specific question of religious, religious study. Um, and the same thing happened also with Carl Schmitt, you know, who was also a Catholic and a theologian. Both of them also had trouble with their marriages <coughs> because I think Heidegger married a Protestant or whatever mm -hmm. happened and, and uh, so they had this tension but what made them out of this Catholic background to be inclined to fascism and to hate socialism and so, so that you know, one should explore this a little bit but it came to me that uh, they all were Catholic and Hitler was a Catholic himself so was Goebbels too the Catholic Church had even paid the doctorate of Goebbels, they had given him a loan, which he paid back when he was Hitler's propaganda minister. So um, also, um, 
not only was Hitler in a, in a, in a Catholic school which raised him, but later on when he had an apartment in Munich, you know, they had continued priests there as friends. Um, the priests sold his pictures and made the living possible for him, you know. A strange type of connection. There was, there was a priest, Father Leo, uh, who visited him in, in Munich all the time. And then came the Röhm Putsch. Um, Röhm was one of his leaders, and he was a homosexual. So they had sent him to Argentine, where all the fascists are, because they were embarrassed about his homosexuality. But then he came back again and uh, had a, was very people were very much for him and so and the party the SA and he was the leader of the SA and then Hitler decided on one day the night of the uh, long night knives, night of the long night yeah when he drove down with the SS or sent the SS down and the SA had a party meeting and they lived in the villages around Berlin uh, around Munich and um, uh, then they uh, went to these uh, little hotels and they found some of these SA men with little Hitler youth boys. That means they were homosexuals like like their leader Röhm and uh, and they killed about uh, the SS killed about 280 or whatever of these SA men and Röhm was put into prison and Hitler told him since he was his friend he gave him that privilege to shoot himself and Röhm threw the revolver to the police and said, you do it, you cowards, and so on. They, they shot him then. So, um, the, uh, but in this struggle, Father Leo, who had been an order man, but he left the order, but he was still a secular priest, uh, was killed by the SS. And Hitler was, you know, raging through, the, through his apartment for days and days, they have killed my dear father Leo. They have these dogs, these pigs, have killed my dear father Leo, and so on. So that means the SS had done something which he was not in agreement with whatsoever, and he hated the SS for having killed his dear father Leo. And so, on. so now uh, that is also, and I still want to write this book there about, uh, and I've started it, and I started a hundred times already, um, in order to get the theology of Hitler. Um, what 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 he thought and what this Catholic education did to him and what came out of all of this. Uh, he was in, in the um, in East Prussia. He discussed once night uh, these table talks like Luther. So he had table talks and and he Stimmt. said, "Well, have you have you ever read uh, Julian Apostata? You know that was a great man. You know it, it seems that he was fifty years old and never had heard about Julian Apostata." And that this was a completely new thing for him. So he he finished high school, Hitler, but everything else, well, he was an autodidact, he taught himself. But such an essential thing, you know, like, like this reactionary Julian Apostata, that he didn't know that in his education, that is, you know, shows a lot of it. And then he was very much for him, the Julian Apostata, was apostat, was of course the Christians called him that way. So by that time the emperors had become Christian already so it was several generations after Constantine and uh, then the um, Julian had been treated badly by his relatives and they were all Christians and he hated them so he started a counter-revolution he uh, uh, rebuilt all the temples again he put the priesthood in again like we have in the religion upon elsewhere and other under Nazism that people want to go behind Christianity again. So he wanted to go before Christianity had happened. And uh, so, and, and then he added something to it. He was smart. The Christians had become popular because of their hospitals. Like today, the, the, the uh, Islamic Brotherhood, you know. Mm -hmm. Their social services and the, the to care for the sick and so on was very, made it very popular. So he ordered that all these pagan priests had to have a hospital beside the thing. And then he went to uh, went to East Fort in India, and uh, on the way he had to go to Jerusalem, and there in Jerusalem he ordered that the temple would be rebuilt, and so that was 360 years after it had been destroyed, and uh, well, the Romans themselves. So, but in his hate against Christianity, he wanted his temple to be rebuilt, and uh, so they started to rebuild it, but when he he fell in battle. And then they brought him back, and 
and they brought it back. That building which they had built up had been destroyed again by an earthquake. And of course, the Christians thought that was a great miracle for them. And so uh, it was never, they never tried again to rebuild the temple. Up to, there's a small group in Israel who think that the temple has to be rebuilt before, um, before the Messiah can come. And the state of Israel has to watch the tunnel underneath the mosque there and have somebody put some powder there and blows up the whole thing. That would really be the, the, the Holocaust starting there. If that would happen. Okay, so uh, so this uh, just let's finish up this thing. Another so they go to exile. They uh, the most of them go to uh, first they went to Switzerland, then to France, then to England, and finally they some stayed in England and then they went to uh, to New York and uh, then in Columbia University they found a home and a wonderful scene there. They had a very uh, extremely conservative. Uh, the president there, and so Horkheimer uh, went to him, and suddenly the president said, "No, go over there to this building and look at it." And so Horkheimer went over, and, and the president said, "Well, what do you think about the very good building?" "Well, it's yours," he said. And so Horkheimer didn't speak English very well yet, and he didn't know what he had said. <laughs> so he went home and said, "What did he say? The building belongs to us, or whatever." And then he wrote back and said, President, you know, what did you say? Did you say it's ours? You bet. He said, <laughs> you bet. Nothing else than you bet. And he never understood that, neither what that meant. But for 12 years, they were in this building, and they did all these studies, you know, about the authoritarian personality, the authoritarian family, the authoritarian state, and so on. <laughs> the, um, uh, so that became the headquarters. The Horkheimer, because of his health, he went to California there and there. He joined the German colony where Thomas Mann and the musicians and so on, they were all there uh, near Los Angeles. <coughs> but the institute remained there. So that is a, a big chapter. And the main work which was produced there was then the Dialectic of Enlightenment. That was the main work. But there were the, Horkheimer was also the leader of the uh, uh, Jewish alliance and he led uh, studies on anti Semitism and so on and so on. So, and then the question would they go back and so there was a long discussion and finally should they go back into this uh, you know ruined uh, German Frankfurt there and so on and finally after long struggles they decided and the Frankfurt city was very generous out of guilt feelings and so they gave money out of their poverty to build to rebuild that thing and they made him Horkheimer a professor also Adorno I think Adorno had no habilitation and they made him professor anyway in Germany, you need two doctorates, practically. I've just, in political science, I had the PhD guy last semester, and he went to Munich now, and he wants to do the habilitation now in, in Munich. He studied Brecht there, but uh, this smart fellow, and the political scientists were very nice here about this. So one can do these things here, you know, and in sociology and so on. In that sense, uh, they're all positivists, but they are uh, tolerant, and uh, so they are all very quantitative, but they allow qualitative studies too, and that uh, I f found out through the years that this is a uh, wonderful thing here. Not there everywhere. So, uh, uh, so then, so they, they decided to go, and then they started to continue their studies. And uh, they thought, when they are under fascism, they had to be revolutionary. When they had to, when they were under liberalism, they had to preserve the values of the past and so on. So they changed somewhere their function or what their mission was under liberalism. Um, and then the Jew, uh, the educated people like Habermas, and you have that in your uh, syllabus there, um, you have to think of people who grew up under fascism now like, like Habermas or so on. Hannes is the next generation. Um, the, uh, uh, suddenly there comes a completely new wind is blowing. So they, were suddenly faced with the critical theory, which was Marxist, but which also had a lot of liberal elements in it, and so on. So it was a real awakening for them, and so they had a whole generation of youngsters in the same age of Horkheimer, Habermas, and uh, they educated them. And uh, it, uh, the critical theory became very broadly known from Japan through this country to Europe, to Frankfurt and, and Rome, and so on. And out of this developed then this youth movement. Now it was partially genuine and specific, but it was also repetition. The youth had rebelled the first time before.
before 1914, it was the first youth movement against what Max Weber in Heidelberg had called the iron cage of capitalism, uh, this frozen system there, which is separate from what is going on inside of people, in which people cannot really express their inside anymore because of this extreme division of labor. Um, you, when you work, you know, for Opel or in a car factory, and nobody sees that when you put the f fenders on and so on, that this is your work. So when I look up there, this is a Picasso. Everybody knows this is a Picasso. But when you look at a Mercedes or whatever, you know, the workers who work there all night long on it, you don't know that it's Fritz or Hans or whatever. So that means you cannot objectivate yourself and in the system you don't see yourself in that system. You are not coming back to yourself. You are coming back to yourself maybe in the form of your wage, but that is a small part of what you really produce. So most of this doesn't come back. So remember the last time we talked about freedom or we talked about spirit and spirit and freedom are the same thing. And it's spirit and love is the same thing. That means you go out to somebody and at the same time return to yourself. Love is this unitive force which brings two very different people together. So, And you are free when you can come home to yourself. And Narcissus cannot go out and Don Juan cannot come back. And these are the pathology. This is the pathology of spirit. So if we say the pathology of spirit or the pathology of uh, freedom or the uh, pathology of reason is the same thing. And why have a hard time to grasp that? We don't know what the hell that is, what it's supposed to be sick. And therefore we don't know exactly how we can heal it. But it is really what they wanted to rescue, you know, from fascism and uh, into liberalism and also against socialism is that concept of spirit, which you do have in the religions, you have it in art, you have it in old philosophy and so on, but you don't have it in the sciences. Skinner has no spirit. Skinner has a black box. And the same thing is for the cognitive guys with their brain stuff and so on. So the spirit got lost. We In, in speeches, uh, we, we mention it sometimes, the spirit of the nation or whatever, but it's rather poetical. It's nothing scientific, you know, scientific determination. And we tried to make that clear the last time. So, um, Nevertheless, the uh, the youngsters were fascinated by it, and they rebelled then, before 1914, and then they were all, when the war came, they were all drafted, and all these young idealists, they were running against each other, and gassed each other, and killed each other, and so on. Then there was a second movement, youth movement, in between the two wars, and they still run against this frozen type of a capitalistic system, this soulless thing, this spiritless thing, thing there, sitting there, uh, petrified, and so on, and they wanted to have new love, and new religion, and new politics, and so on, and then they were put into these Hitler youth, and Mussolini youth, and nationalistic youth, and they again found themselves in the battlefields and shot each other. One cannot talk about these wars without talking about capitalism, of course. And then, uh, the um, finally, that was the 60s, 70s, that was the third youth movement where they again wanted to go into the Alps and uh, have new love and new uh, 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 type of work and new religion and new politics and so on. And then comes the Nixon counter-revolution, you know, which is in the book, which was according to which that was done, and Kent State, where the students were shot by the National Guard and 300 were shot in Mexico City. And from, uh, from uh, Japan to Italy, there were people who were killed in the process and it was repressed. That means the youth was uh, pushed back again into the iron cage. Uh, they had so much optimism. Uh, they thought they were in a free country. I was their spokesman here in, uh, in Detroit, and here the connection between them and the universities. So I was deeply involved in the whole thing. In the campus, they took over the uh, student center and uh, protested and turned the bus upside down, took the flag down. They uh, were very sad scenes there, the whole thing. I stuck together with Seibert, you know, the Seibert building. Seibert was the vice president, and <laughs> it was a rainy day when they took the flag down. It was down in the, in the dirt down there, and uh, it was a very, very sad story. The Seibert was a decent man. He stood there and didn't know what to do about it, and um, and the students themselves were, after they had shouted a lot, but after they had the flag down, they were all quiet, and 
I don't know if they were really happy about what they had done. And so on. The black people from the north side occupied the whole cafeteria for several days, and so it, it was here. We had it here, and um, some of them were bakuninists, and uh, most of them had somehow read Bakuse and Eric Fromm, and uh, uh, had been wanted to have uh, uh, wanted to have new love, and but. Also there, I had them, they came here in the Gestapo, and not the Gestapo, the FBI, and <laughs> the CIA, they were sitting outside there all the time, I wanted to catch the students, and if they had caught one, and I gave them a shirt or whatever, I would have to go to prison for five years and pay $5,000, that was a punishment. The judges were very good downtown, they said they have to come, the, the FBI has to come to us first before they can do anything. Well, they entered the house anyway without uh, without judge's uh, permission and uh, and frightened my wife and, uh, and children and so on for weeks and weeks and and then the students you know sometimes run out to the kitchen door there were forests in the back there was the forest and then the fat FBI guys after them and then they came back and hadn't caught them of course were out of breath say why are you doing this to yourself you know they can run faster and so on so well, why do the little children there the whole mafia is down there they could ke- occupy you know day and night and so on Instead of one young after those children and so on. They had long discussions. They were all Catholics, by the way, and had their revolver there and their jackets sitting there. So it was a strange situation. And I talked to the Senate about them, you know, it was, it was pitiful, the whole thing. <laughs> but they didn't understand what it was, uh, really, why that happened. They, they were supposed to be good and tame, and now they all rebelled. So it was a big crisis, you know, and. Uh, uh, it was not a real revolution. They never got the workers on their side here. The workers were completely passive. <coughs> in France, they got the workers on their side. So there was a time when the workers and the students marched together. So in terms of revolution and counter-revolution, a revolution can only be made by the fourth estate at this moment in history, not by the third estate. Or They can make a counter-revolution, and the students certainly cannot do it. They could have been a catalyst to wake up the uh, the workers, but no no worker was woken up here in Kalamazoo. This is a very right wing town with Father Coughlin, the fascist priest, who was a radio priest in Detroit. He was here, and uh, they were communists here in the paper mills. Um, they were active, but then there were all these followers of Father Coughlin on the other side, and they were the stronger part. So, so we had it here in our town. So, um, and, uh, so the movement was beaten down and uh, today you have all these reflections on the bad 60s and 70s and many people have a very bad memory. Also many professors here who hated that the students got up in the classroom and wanted to discuss and so on. So their, their quiet life was interrupted. So they all think back with awe of this uh, upheaval which took place. So. <laughs> Nevertheless, the um, Frankfurt School survived it there. The studies went on, and they go on. And I brought you here something which I just uh, got there, which they sent me from the Institute. We we are in contact with them, and if somebody a few goes, I want to organize something that more people can go with me there to uh, uh, to the um, to Fra- Frankfurt and then to to probably through Frankfurt. Um, that would be nice. Traveling is important, so. I have made contact with the Henneke Institute um, in order to get this for the future. Uh, here it is, I think. Yeah. So this is what they send around here. You see the Institute, it has been renovated, so it's quite bigger and you can get uh, grants to go there and you can study there. Newsletter from uh, January 2013. And uh, it's unfortunately this is all in German in there, but you see what um, no, but some of the stuff is English and French and so on. But this is the living center there we are talking about, and there is uh, uh, evidence that it really exists. Okay, so uh, then that is you know it shows us the the history of the whole thing. Mention a few. Um, of the Frankfurt School's present consequences. Well, I think it has spread now. Uh, you know, the uh, Hanif is at Columbia University. It's a 
the professor there and a the professor in Frankfurt. Habermas is studying Northwestern University, is teaching Northwestern, and so on. So in the meantime, I think it has penetrated the country. Okay, five. Uh, what? How late is it now? Um, do you want to make uh, what is it we had now? Uh, Six thirty, seven thirty. Uh, hour. Let's, let's make a short rest. You can stand up, dance around, eat cookies, and uh, then we and you. Freiburg. That's where. Freiburg. Yeah. I right. was. Exactly. That's in your way. Alex, what happened? You were sick. Oh, Did you I feel miserable? I've been trying to get things established for this semester so I can graduate. Oh. I have a lot of areas yeah. that I've been running and okay. things to attend to. Are you teaching now? Or? Um, no. I'm no. TAing for a okay. class and then the intro to yeah. religion. Oh, intro too. Oh. Yeah, but I also have to get my exam readings yeah. and schedules. Do you have another class? Um, I'm also, yeah, I'm in the theory and method class. Yeah. I'm taking it as an independent study. Oh, oh, I've oh. already taken that you class. You can do that, huh? Yeah, because I took it with Dr. Guo. Yeah. Um, but that was only the, that was before they changed the curriculum. Uh huh. Because they had the classics Again, and then huh. the contemporary. So yeah. I took the contemporary theory. Yeah. But now they've condensed it into one class. Oh. I thought maybe I should take it. It gets in and in all the time. Yeah. Condensed into one now? Uh -huh. Yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah I had it in two classes. Two classes. Things. They want to get into one class now logic and writing and the 2000 thing there they want to theory yeah yeah the religion religious theory mm -hmm. logic and reading in one class i wonder who is supposed to do that and then they reduce that down yeah. and they're not having anyone write theses anymore do they are they just uh -huh. no they do, yeah they, they discourage that i'm the only one who wants to people to write a thesis but all the others they tell everybody they should take an exam and, and you know. My thesis is published. Yeah, I, I thought it was a nice thing to <laughs> have a nice conclusion, you know. Uh-huh. I don't know why they don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, it feels kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. yeah, it is, yeah. Finishing up with just taking two tests yeah. on two days or something. Yeah, right. So it, it is a nice conclusion and you have something to show your grandchildren, you know. What you had to suffer and what great things you did. <laughs> I have the thesis of my wife still, you know, and it's, it's beautiful to to read that, you know. Later on, well. So you finally found your dissertation, didn't you? I have it in Frankfurt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know what. I wonder if they have it. If they ever published it? I'm not sure. It was a journal which was supposed to publish it. Mm -hmm. No, the professor is dead now. I got an email from Sayyid Java today, and that book on the future of religion is just published. So you wrote something for that too, right? Did I? Yeah, I and it, it's in London, so it just was published this week, I think. And so I sent him an email to send us yeah. copies of it. So okay, yeah, let's look. I have something. Mm -hmm. And the other one? Did you say something about the other one? But the oh, on the from yeah. one, not to me. Yeah. Uh, but you sent him your your yeah, article, right? right? And yeah. so he has to edit that. Him and uh, Robert Lake, and I think he's in Georgia. Do they do that Florida. together? They do it together. Yeah. Oh. He's in Georgia or Florida or something like that. Really? But, oh. but uh, Rainer Funk yeah. is wrote the introduction. Oh, to really? this book. So oh, that's good. Yeah. The literary uh, yeah. the estate executor of Eric Frum. So. Mm -hmm. He's writing the introduction, then our articles are in there, and then I think yeah. maybe six or seven more. Oh. So that would have been good for Walter to write something. Yeah. But I don't know. Walter says he's not motivated in the morning anymore. He was supposed to come, and so he has a hard time to get out of bed, which is a sign of uh, depression, you know. Yeah. And they don't want to pay for his uh, physical uh, things anymore. The old uh, red cross and blue shield there. Blue cross, blue shield, uh, and that means they think it is not physical, mm. Mm. so they don't want to pay for it. Yeah, it's a horrible thing, you know, these depressions when you when you don't know why to get up anymore and mm. are only awake when you're twelve o'clock. 
you know, but I, I gave him this form thing, you know, because I thought it would have a healing effect, you know, from mm -hmm. the very healing person. But it didn't work, obviously. I don't know, man. That's why I'm productive in the morning. Yeah. Come afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> He's well, productive he can, he, can, <laughs> he can make money, you know, too, and uh, he needs it, but he just mm -hmm. didn't come. You know that Heidegger only he never apologized. No. But he said in 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 um, one conversation that was recorded, only one, mm -hmm. that his time with uh, fascism was the gross dumbheit sinus lebens, oh. the the greatest stupidity of my life. But that was it. Yeah, right. That was all he ever said. Well, and he had that guy. To what was his name? The other guy who was closest to him and he was in Dubrovnik, he participated in my course. Gadamer. Gadamer, yeah. And Gadamer, you know, said his wife was very ambitious, that was the reason, and he was very naive, you know, I mean, uh, why was it Dummheit? Because it, it went wrong in the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's when it became a Dummheit, you know. With my, my professor Lord's the history guy was also a fascist, and then later on they cursed Hitler, you know, for doing this, but they were all with him. Yeah. There were a lot of theologians, Protestants and Catholics, who were all on his side. Yeah, for Heidegger, though, you know, communismus was uneigentlichkeit, you know what I mean? It was inauthentic yeah. for, for Germany. I mean, we want to be critical, you know, fascism, we want to be critical of socialism, we want to be critical of liberalism, you know. I mean, they're all human attempts, you know, to solve unbelievable problems, so therefore they should be taken seriously, you know. But I mean, they, they they are sorry. Maybe if they are sorry, they are sorry because they have been caught, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, Heidegger never converted, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. in the posthumous article, uh, which was in the Spiegel, he uh, he was still still fascist up to yeah. the end. Yeah, and of course he said only God can save us. That right. was the whole thing, you know. And, and that was not entirely clear. Is it the emphasis of God or us or saving or whatever? Right. Like they analyzed that title there. But the same thing with Karl Schmidt and so on. So they remained uh, fashion and said, well, Hitler made all these mistakes and they got us into trouble, you know, but uh, and maybe we shouldn't have done that against the Jews or whatever, but that's not, it's not honest. Yeah. Okay, uh, are we ready again? Let's do it before we get to our movie there. Um, we came to. Uh, so don't bother if you, you know, haven't read Siddiq, of course you have not read Siddiq, then just leave it out, you know, if you haven't had honor, then leave that out. Um, if you want to concentrate on Habermas, take Habermas, if you want to take Hannes, do Hannes, right? Don't uh, don't be bothered about uh, these. I just put them together because they, they belong together, but you we, we all have to limit ourselves. So five now, what has happened to the notion of spirit? That was our whole discussion the last time, right? Well, it got lost. Then there are some people who want to bring it back to rescue, also positivists and so on. Uh, so, but of course, the pathology of reason, reason is one name, you know, for spirit. So, if you read Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit, of the mind, uh, we don't know how to translate this really, then you see he goes through all the stages of human consciousness. So sense perception, for instance, one stage, you know. Another one is analytical understanding, that is all our sciences and so on. Another one is then dialectical reason and so on. So it's sense perception, understanding, reason. They are all stages in the development of what spirit finally means. So we could, instead of saying, you know, pathology of reason, we could also say pathology of, um, of spirit or pathology of mind, and uh, when we look at what the uh, subjective spirit means, and you have it on your uh, road maps there, you know, I, th I think you, I hope you have printed it out, but the road map you have there under um, subjective, human subjectivity there, <laughs> that would mean, you know, subjective spirit. So, um, we have nature, and we have the human organism. So Hegel divided, and Marx does that too, in the Frankfurt School, 
there is nature, but then there is also man. And man is different from nature, and uh, on one side man has this organism, there's the human organism, that means our form and our assimilation, eating and drinking, and our sexuality and so on. But it is all uh, somehow superseded uh, into human subjectivity. Uh, if the body is only seen as something negative, as you have in the Bhagavad Gita up there, I can read it to you, where from the very first chapters it says you have to get rid of body consciousness and so on. So we have it in the West too, dualism between the body and the soul, St. Augustine, who never overcame his Manichaeism. Manichaeism was a dualism between the material, the matter, and, and the soul, and the, the spirit on the other side. And that went back to Persia, Mani came from uh, Persepolis, uh, the capital of Persia. And uh, that's so nice that they translated one of my whatever articles there into Parsi, now into the Persian language. So, and uh, it goes back, of course, to Zoroastrianism, which was dualistic. So the real enemy of, um, of Hegel and also the Frankfurt School are dualisms. These dualisms must not stand, they must be resolved, you know. They're these antagonisms which you have here, uh, you know, three pages later, you have about 50 antagonisms. They're all dualisms. And these dualisms must not remain. They, they're bad that they are there, so they should be resolved. So, uh, but Augustine, you know, you, uh, it went bad, it was for nine years or whatever, he was at Manichaean. And um, so the originally it is Ahura Mazda and Ariman. Ahura Mazda is the god of light and goodness and so on. Ariman is the father of lies and the father of murder and so on. He's the dark guy of darkness. And the Persian had to uh, uh, fight between those two forces. They were not only objective, they were in him as psychological forces. They had to make, the ego had to make a decision. I want to follow Ahura Mazda and light or I want to follow the other one, the forces of darkness, and so on. <laughs> so um, we have uh, also not only Mani, we have another branch of them, which was the uh, the guy there whom the Roman army uh, honored all the time, and the unbelievable alt altars everywhere. And Mithra? Um, My Mitra, yeah. My Mitras, 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 yeah. Mitras was one of the seven spirits around Ahura Mazda, and he uh, became part of, uh, uh, became a simple, singular god, god for the Roman Empire, emphasizing chastity and fortitude and so on. And you see him as a young man with a, some kind of a coat over his shoulder, and he has a thought of which he kills the bull. So the bull was the symbol of Ariman, and you have it all through southern England and so on. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, it was the opponent, really, of Christianity. Constantine's father had been a Mitras uh, servant, and um, the, the story there where uh, the, uh, the emperor wanted to conquer Rome, um, and he saw in the sun, he saw the cross, and it said, in this sign you will conquer. The sun was the symbol of my trust and the cross of Christianity and so uh, the, the emperor put it all on his flags the sun and, and the cross in it and won he marched over the Milvian Bridge and took Rome and that was a sign that Christ was more powerful than my trust and slowly Christianity then became the Roman state religion that is a decisive point there. So, and, and from there it goes to Maitras and the other side to Mani. Mani was a, a fellow in 250 in Persepolis who uh, wanted to um, uh, somehow baptize the Persian religion and brought it together with Christianity and that meant um, the God of the Old Testament was the bad God, the creator God who did this material world there. And then there was the God of the New Testament was the God of light the spirit and so on. So that uh, uh, that was condemned by the church. The church is uh, condemned to the Manichaeism, Mitraism, and Manichaeism. They condemned this dualism and uh, said that you know the New Testament, the the Hebrew Bible, is the predecessor of the New Testament, and uh, uh, they both you know belong together. And uh, even the council.
Council again and the Popes recently emphasized again that the covenants of the Hebrew Bible are valid also for Christians as well but uh, the August, Augustine had a, this dualism which was present in him he was a genius but he was not able to resolve it so after nine years of concubinage with his wife he didn't even mention her name in, in his confessions that is a very bad symptom you know so she loved him. She wanted to stay with him, and he sent her back to Africa. They had an illegitimate child, which was Adeodatus. He called him Adeodatus, uh, given by God. He was born in a concubinage, but he was still given by God. Uh, up to the day, prostitutes in Rome, you know, are on this, go there to their business at night, and in the morning they go to Mass, because the one thing has to do with the spirit, and the other has to do with the body. The body is dirty, but the spirit is pure, and so on. So, therefore, St. Augustine, he was a rhetoric professor and he, uh, of literature, and so on, and that was spirit, and that was good, and the other side there was the body, the concubinage, and so on. He sent the woman away, he went back to Africa, they were both Africans. It's wrong there, St. Augustine, that they have this white, white St. Augustine there. Also, his mother is here in town, Monica, and she's white too. I always tell the students in 50 years to paint them black, but nobody takes the leather there and, and paints them really. And then this, and Ambrose is here too in town, which was a white Aryan teacher of St. Augustine. So, but St. Augustine had trouble with his sexuality up to uh, his 80s or whatever. He could never resolve it. And it got into his writings and the whole messed up uh, morality of sex or so which we have uh, has something to do with this that he was not able to uh, to deal with that and I don't know if Thomas Aquinas was better Thomas Aquinas they had put him into a Benedictine monastery and wanted to make him a little monk uh, and then others wanted to free himself from that monk business and put him together with the prostitute but he didn't even touch her He instead of going with the prostitute he went from the Benedictine to the Dominicans to the beggar order and then continued Augustine's dualism for a long time which he didn't have to because he shifted over from Platonism to Aristotelianism. so there are tragic decisions and which have happened so that this mess there this massive child abuse and the homosexual thing in the clergy and, and all that stuff and, and the pill acrobatics and, and so on has something to do with this unresolved type of a dualism. So the issue is not the body is not the enemy on one side, and then there's the spirit on top of it, uh, including asceticism. And the East, of course, too, there where the, the, the will to life has to be killed off by taking the images away, the images of sexuality, of aggression, and so on. And then you tame it down, and uh, then the Buddha smiles happily and closes his eyes and gazes on his navel and so on. So there's this dualism there sometimes even there is present in the asceticism. <laughs> so the um, nevertheless this uh, 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 the what we want to is what we were about here was this human subjectivity. So we have the human uh, the, the subjective spirit, the objective spirit and the absolute spirit. The absolute spirit is art, religion and philosophy. That is the cultural word. The objective spirit is the social word, and then we have the human subjectivity, so we have three types of spirit, and therefore also the pathology of three types of spirit. But now let's look at the subjective spirit there. There's an anthropological level, and this anthropological level, that is where this transition or this concrete supersession, supersession of the human body uh, takes place. We are not only having a body, but we are that body at the same time. So it's a very intimate type of relationship, and there's something like a nature spirit at work in us. A nature spirit in terms of our feelings, which we have, and the images, and the dreams, and uh, you could say that the whole Freudian psychoanalysis is very uh, discovers this this nature spirit in us, which is to a large extent unconscious and comes through only in our dreams there, or in forbidden thoughts or whatever. So that is the, uh, but besides that, the anthropological level, 
um, uh, is also concerned with our gender, with our being male or female. It is concerned with our nationality, and not our physical, but also our national character, which we, even when you immigrate, you keep your national character or your racial character. That all belongs into this subjective spirit sphere. And then we have the phenomenological level, where we have those five human potentials, like language and memory, work and tools, sex and eroticism, struggle for recognition and nation. We said already that Habermas, they emphasized language, and then also struggle for recognition, and then his student, uh, Honneth, then emphasized the struggle for recognition and put his whole existence on that. But these are the two things which they, where they are based in this subjective spirit, so to speak. So uh, then we have psychology proper, uh, that would be memory and the intelligence and the will. So, uh, or you could say it, uh, memory and reason and the will. So that is where the pathology is rooted. Something has gone wrong with that, that we don't remember anymore. Uh, that is part of this pathology, that we are uh, um, somehow um, anamnestic, that we uh, or suffer from anamnesis, that we, we cannot remember what we ate last Sunday or so. The Russians do remember, the traditional societies remember, but uh, it is true for the American society particularly, it has a hard time to remember. I don't think they remember that they just killed one million people in Iraq or whatever, or that last week they uh, killed, even when we discuss the drone thing now, um, they brought it up, I guess. We, we uh, killed a 16-year-old boy, an American citizen, who had not done any crime, but he was the son of a guy who had, uh, we thought he was a traitor, so we, we assassinated him in a non-judicial assassination. And, so, and, and we cannot even remember anymore that we did that. It was just a few months ago or a few years ago. So um, that is part of the pathology. That's what we call it. Or uh, then reason and... Um, and, and then also will, uh, and the subjective spirit is the basis for the objective spirit and for the absolute spirit. Uh, so that's at least one way to look at it. Um, you see, up there where nature is, there, of course, for the idealist, there is something before nature, namely the absolute spirit, God's spirit, God's logic. Um, when you become a materialist, God's logic is really our logic which we have with Feuerbach projected against the sky and so on. But it makes a great difference how you see all this. If you think there is an idea, there is a divine spirit before nature who has objectivated himself in nature and returns to himself through man and through man's works and through religion and so on and so on. So that is the idealistic system and then you turn over to a materialistic one. So materialism does not only mean sex, car, and career, or whatever, as we call somebody a materialist, you know, wants to have money all the time. But that's a rather vulgar type of materialism. Real materialism means that you are convinced that there is nothing before nature. That spirit is not uh, the priori priority in, in the thing, but the first thing is nature. And out of nature then develops human subjectivity and human spirit or whatever, if you want to call it that way. So the idealist has a spirit before nature and the spirit materializes, objectivates itself and then uh, returns to itself by a process of dematerialization or a process of sublimation. You can see that in art, for instance, architecture is still very heavy. Sculpture becomes already lighter painting is still lighter, music is still seems to have no weight whatsoever, or drama or whatever. So there is a dematerialization happening in, in, in this way. Nature is overcome and returns, the spirit returns to itself. That is an idealistic system. And, the great, uh, and all great philosophy was idealistic. Marcuse uh, and uh, others wanted to write a, philosophy, a history of philosophy where they wanted to look at materialistic elements in idealistic philosophies. The book was never, never came about. So, so all real philosophy is really idealistic in the East and the West. And, um, but there are materialistic elements. So 
Hegel did, for instance, turn around and Jesus says, look for the kingdom first and everything else, food, clothing and so on, will be given to you. Hegel would turn it around and say, look for food and clothing and so on first and then the uh, kingdom will fall to you and so on. That is uh, turned around into materialism in an idealistic philosopher and so on. All our sciences are materialistic. So um, the professors on campus are all agnostics. Uh, an agnostic means when I study sociology or psychology or whatever, the methods which I use there do not reach beyond the finite word, uh, not beyond the senses and so on. But there may be something before there to what everything goes to, but I cannot say anything about that, and that would be called agnosticism. Atheism means that you are convinced and you think you can scientifically prove that there is nothing before nature. But I found out when I taught in, in the Eastern Europe Socialistic University in, in uh, there, uh, in, where was it, in, in um, Yugoslavia and also in East Germany, um, many of the professors were not atheists any longer. They had become agnostics like ours are here. Uh, so the, uh, the we we can only have a religion department, not a theology department, because they cannot say anything about this what is there before, and uh, so they have to stop. But there may be something they don't deny it, so they are not atheists. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> agnosticism hmm? um, kind of similar to the of the critical theory that? Iconoclasm means, you know, you destroy icons and, and so on, so that's a specific type of thing. But um, uh, the, uh, they do combine, you know, what we said, Moses, the uh, not to make images of the Absolute or to name the Absolute, and they even radicalize Moses even, because Moses is very radical in terms of images. So you could say icons, you know, images, and destroys images. But um, so that uh, uh, that could be called I iconoclasm. But with a name, uh, it, it only says the abuse of names. But names are always bound to finite things, and when you use finite names to the absolute, then that would be forbidden too. In that sense, they radicalize it, and they connect it with Kant. So your question is really if Kant is not an agnostic in that sense, right? So, um, on the level of analytical understanding, yes. So, that means analytical understanding is not allowed to penetrate the thing in itself. That could be called agnosticism. We cannot describe what the absolute is. If we do that, we get into antinomies. That means into contradictions between saying, God is powerful and God is all just and God is all loving and so on and these attributes all contradict each other so when the human un analytical understanding, not reason Kant is the one who separates already between understanding and reason what we do on campus is really we are operating on the level of analytical understanding we analyze things all the time so that's where you get the dualisms on the level of reason then, you try to overcome these dualisms, to dissolve these antagonisms, to dissolve these antinomies. So therefore, in Hegel takes that up and, and uh, leads it further. So, and, but the, uh, the Kant goes one step further, he was a believing Protestant. Uh, he thought that we could not have any ethics or morality or moral life at all if we would not at least postulate what we cannot know and that is to postulate God and to postulate uh, immortality and postulate freedom. If we do not postulate immortality, then the bush gets away, the mass murderer, because we don't have the guts to put him on trial here, nor to send him to Den Haag for the war criminal trial for two wars. Uh, so, therefore, if that gets around, people say, you know, all these criminals get away, you know. Why should I be killed for killing 20 when he killed a million, you know? and does that in the name of the state, and, and uh, it is all okay. So 
that nobody, you know, not even in the churches, remembers or repents or mourns that we killed all these people. Uh, they, they, they are for the embryo, they want to rescue the embryo, but how many people were incinerated through our bombings there who were pregnant and the embryos went under with them and so on. There is no mourning, you know. By the way, in this institute there, in fact, for the Psychoanalytic Institute, after the war there was a woman and a, ma a married couple, Mitchellich, and they concentrated on this disease of the mind, this inability of the Germans to mourn. They had been responsible for that war. They had killed 27 million Russians. They had killed 6 million Jews, and they could not mourn. That is the pathology of spirit. And they concentrated on, on this issue there. So, Rudy, can you, you, oh, I, yeah, yes. couldn't you think also, you know, to your question about agnosticism in, in the Bilderverbot or the image ban, yeah. or even negative theology, that it's not quite the same in the sense that negative theology knows, positively knows, what God is not. Yeah. Where an agnostic, in that sense, has no knowledge, um, even that knowledge. positive or negative, yeah. in that sense. So, from, and from where do you get come with the idea that you know anything about God? Well, that means analytical understanding cannot come. You know, analytical understanding cannot penetrate the thing in itself. Mm -hmm. That means it cannot. We cannot say anything analytical about God or freedom or immortality. But these uh, the people there, when they call about the uh, the utterly other, that comes from Karl Barth and also uh, the, uh, another fellow, um, the, they say something about God. They say that God is the negation of the negativity, like abandonment, like injustice, like alienation and uh, that this negation of the negation is of course an affirmation so it is negative theology you know but this negative theology has an affirmative element and it comes sometimes uh, you know it is Horkheimer and so on they are not entirely obedient to their own position and call that then perfect justice or they call it uh, um, uh, um, unconditional love which cannot be found anywhere in the finite word, you know, when, when, even when you say to somebody, I love you unconditionally, uh, if you analyze enough, you will find some conditions which are, maybe you have to look pretty, or you have to be rich, or you have to live long, or you have to take care of me, or whatever, <laughs> there is some little hidden condition there somewhere, so, and perfect justice going to, into the courtrooms, you know, listen to that girl who just massacred her lover there, and uh, as they go on day and day, you, you cannot imagine how, how they will ever come to any kind of a justice, you know, with this jury. Uh, if I had to go to, to an American court procedure, I wouldn't trust that the jury would look through my eyes. I was too many times on the jury, you know, and uh, you know, how, how almost impossible that is, you know. How can a white jury look through the eyes of a black guy of the slums in Kalamazoo, you know. It's a hopeless affair. And so. so so these are things which are, cannot be found in the world of appearance, um, and, uh, and they are somehow, you know, connected with this totally other. So this totally other is something which one could does not know. In this case, you could call it agnosticism, but then when you really see, it is not entirely empty. This totally other, like the supreme being of Rousseau and and Voltaire, you know, of deism. Uh, but even there, the, this deistic God has created the world. There's one determination, at least. They know one thing. He has created everything. And then he left the whole thing, you know, and the world is then atheistic and God is worldless and so on. Uh, so there is a little bit of knowledge in there. But there is more to it when, when, the, when they talk about this a community of people who have this longing for this utterly other uh, they hope that such a community could come about, people who share this longing then. Uh, and this, what they share, is not entirely... Uh, they would not build concentration camps, those people who have this longing. Uh, they do not want to repress or exploit the uh, proletariat or whatever. So there are determinations 
which maybe cannot be expressed scientifically. So that the doctrine of positivism, that this positive science is the only way how we can know something, they would deny that. They would say there are other ways to know, you know. So Dostoevsky knows something about this utterly other. Uh, and, and about the psyche. By the way, these two things hang together. Because the death of God led to the death of the soul. You know, we, what, what the Psalms say, soul, or Mohammed calls the soul, Kinnah calls the soul, you know. These are very different things, you know. Um, for for Skinner, what the religious people call the soul is, is a black box, you know. And the cognitive psychologists, they have several black, bo- black boxes, you know, they just multiply the black boxes. And so, so there is agnosticism for both, for God and the soul. Somehow they, these two hang together. And when you look at great theology like Master Eckhart or so, it's unbelievable what they know, you know. I mean, today for us, theology has become small and ugly, you know, and cannot let itself be seen anymore in public. And therefore, we very often don't know what a great theologian once was. I mean, we still have something. There's Bultmann, you know, and there's Karl Barth, and there's Paul Tillich, and so But nobody seems to read them anymore, except, you know, specialists or whatever. So, um, but it, it is a very interesting question now. But <laughs> definitely, you know, when Horkheimer says, uh, takes Psalm 91 and takes the first verse for his parents, the cemetery and the second verse for himself in you eternal one alone I trust he does know something about this now but not on the level of analytical understanding uh, but rather on the level of reason and maybe just on the level of faith but faith is not the absence of reason faith is part of the human history of reason that's why animals don't have religion they cannot have religion because they cannot think. So therefore there is thinking involved in religion. And what this Bader fellow, you know, the, the, uh, when he talks about this critical, uh, critical theory of religion, or rational theory of religion, he wanted to get respect again for religion because it has become so, has been emptied out by the Enlightenment and has just been relegated to a matter of feeling without any reason. So as we have statistics, the more people get educated, the less religious they are. So only uneducated people are religious in turn, you know. Or, or not to speak of hate against religion, whatever it has done to people in turn. So, um, so therefore, the, uh, this longing for the totally other, or utterly other, is not something empty or whatever. It is also not something totally transcendent. It is also something at work in one's life. So um, now it comes from Judaism, it comes from uh, Christianity. You would have to see how much they have negated in these religions and how much they have reserved, uh, which they can still, or you could turn it around, why they had to reject so much in the first place. They had to reject so much because of what happened in the historical process. That means if we look what has happened in the 20th century or 19th century or 21st century, that we kill 250 people, assassinate them non-judicially every month now. And so they say, you know, this idea of an all-powerful and all-loving and benevolent God is simply not acceptable or is almost not acceptable mm-hmm. and criticize Catholics because they have bought this God already of providence together with the real thing with the feudal lords and the slaveholders and so on. And then the Protestants have done that even more so, you know, and they could mean Hegel in a certain sense, because Hegel is different from Schopenhauer by saying, uh, you know, that all these negative things which happen in history, God negates them continually and will ultimately negate them so that the absolute spirit in the end will have conquered Golgotha. You know, this is the image of Christianity behind it. So, Spirit could be defined as that something which conquers Golgotha, the slaughter bench of the historical process. It, the, the spirit is so unbelievably powerful and also good that all this can be, that these, all these negativities can be negated. 
and they would say to people like Schopenhauer, and maybe also to the critical theorists, they would say, you are wallowing around in this negativity and you feel even good. You are sitting in a beautiful hotel and then you talk about all these bad things and so on. And, and then you are not even interested to, uh, to overcome these dualisms, you know. So he, he thinks that these negativists are uh, somehow, and they were called by Hitler negativists, Hitler was a positivist, so they called him negativist. So uh, these neg Hegel would be against those negativists, not because he didn't know that there was this horrible negativity around. He has pages in the philosophy of history where he is as negative as Schopenhauer is. But the difference is, where Schopenhauer calls him this cursed optimist, is that it will be conquered, that there is a plan, that there is a purpose, and that the purpose is not a particular finite one, but an infinite purpose is that the spirit comes back to itself and conquers in itself this Golgotha, this slaughter bench. And so the spirit of a family is this power which can overcome the negativity which is there in the battle of the genders or the battle of the generations and so on. This, this family has a good spirit that's what we mean. We mean that spirit is the negation of the negativity which is in it naturally because family is still a very natural thing uh, in terms of the gender struggle and, and the uh, and, so on. and then also a state, you know, the spirit of a state. The Hegel is very often attacked because saying that the state is, you know, an image of God in this world and so on. He would say the same thing about the family and so on. In so far as the state, you know, is not a dead mechanism, a machine or whatever, as it may be for us, but it is a unity of the citizens which have the power to overcome whatever negativity, including the class struggle and so on, uh, is going on in itself. And that's what the people in their rhetoric, you know, in festivities and so on, what they mean is the spirit of the American nation or whatever. We have gone through so much, you know. We will go through this too. We will be up to this crisis now, this, you know, finance disaster. We will conquer that too. That is an expression of what once was called spirit. Spirit is negation of negation. If you want to put it on the formula, you could say it's a negation of the negation. It is this utterly other is the absolute spirit, this utterly other means the negation of the neg negativity of being alone, of being abandoned, of the unbelievable injustices of the class system, of what Marx calls the alienation and so on. That this it will ultimately be overcome, that is Hegel's optimism which separates him from Schopenhauer. But both of them have in common that they know that where we are is hell that this is hell that we have just killed a million, that this is hell that we killed these 250. Or yesterday in this bunker there, he keeps, he keeps that little boy in the bunker there, and uh, and they penetrate, they kill him, the old man, whatever Nazi nut he was, or whatever, or the 20 little ones, and what will be next week, you know. So um, that means uh, Schopenhauer and, and uh, this, uh, and that is, I think, in the Frankfurt School too, they have Hegel, Kant, and Schopenhauer. <laughs> they are agreeing with Schopenhauer and Son about the this evilness of the historical process, but they side with Hegel and Kant, you know, that this may not be the last word. So um, this longing for the totally other can also be expressed that this world of appearances in which we live, with so many injustices, will not be the last word. Only it is not the certainty which Skinner has when he has the, the mice in the box in the Skinner box or whatever uh, it is me, you know uh, for Kant it was a postulate these words show you that there is no scientific method with which this can be known and in that sense you can call it agnosticism when you say what gnosis really is when you say gnosis is the analytical understanding of the, our psychologists, our anthropologists on campus and so on and so on that is agnosticism with the, this type of gnosis cannot penetrate the thing in itself. But it does not mean that there may not be some other kind of gnosis or that there may not be faith. 
which is also a form of knowledge. So then, would it be fair to classify the critical theorists as a faith community? Well, they wouldn't like to be called that way. The, one could say that the beginning, this island of happiness, had this faith element, yes. But so Pollock said it was never, it was not continued. But it seems the basis of all of the critique, the, the mechanisms of critique, mm -hmm. kind of come from a particular form of Judeo-Christian values and ethics. And then once you prohibit, prohibit the images of the absolute and can't approach the thing in itself, how do you go from there and posit an ethics that doesn't require like a faith? It wouldn't be possible, you know, if it wouldn't be possible if that was the supreme, the supreme being of the bourgeois enlightenment, then it couldn't be done. But see, even when they now deny, they uh, uh, negate the images, Apollo, Zeus, you know, these are all the images concrete, you know, the gods of Babylon, the gods of Egypt, you know, these are the images. They are either representing natural forces or they represent historical forces, like decay, you know, the, the goddess of... Uh, of justice or, or nemesis, you know, the goddess of justice and so on. Now they do not negate, and this is a very important word now of this type of a logic, they do not negate those gods and their images abstractly and simply say they are nonsense, you know, but they, in their negation they also preserve something and rescue it in terms of the truth. Because what they call the truth is exactly this negation of the negation, which would be something affirmative. But the, what, neg what the negative dialectics of Adorno means now is that they had the experience that the negative fascism was overcome by the Soviet and the American armies and so on, but that there was no affirmation. It is while for Hegel it was certain that the negation of the negation leads to affirmation. For these people, because of their historical experience, where they have found out that in large measures, the negation of the negation, all these dead people, 70 million people, and this negation of the negation did not lead to an affirmation, but it led to restoration. That means they restored the same civil society, the same liberal society, out of which communism and fascism, as its counterpart, developed. That is where the doubt comes from, and where you could escape, again say that there is some agnostic element coming in, right? Or putting in, in, in religious language, they cannot see, you know, how, as the world really moves, how this message of an all-benevolent and all-powerful God can be held on to. There is the fascist version. You have to get them, all three of them together in this discourse. Because what, uh, what Hitler did was to push forward what the Protestants and the Catholic had done before, but more in a radical way. Namely, that this God of Providence, the Almighty, the Lord, was identical with historical process. That this God that this process was one of the predator and the prey, as it is in nature, turn on the nature channel. And um, the, therefore, Hitler would say, look, I'm not responsible for nature, I'm not responsible for, uh, for history. I'm not responsible that every organism has to tear another organism to pieces in order to maintain itself. I just ate a little cheeseburger or whatever. So, therefore, and it's going on and on and on all the time. That's horrifying. That is the theodicy uh, experience for which the Gautama was very sensitive. Other people are completely insensitive and don't feel anything when they eat a cheeseburger. So um, that's... Um, okay, so uh, let, let me go back to that thought about not having a content. It has a content in that sense that the images or that part of the images or whatever may be true in the image is rescued. So let's take nemesis, right? Nemesis means that if you lose measure, if you are measurelessly individualistic or greedy or so, 
you have to expect that a counterforce will set in. That happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and in Babylon, and in Berlin with Hitler, and so on. That element is contained in the idea that the absolute is the negation of the negativity of greed, of alienation, of dying, of getting old, of being sick, and, and so on and so on. See what I mean? So the, the question, what makes it difficult for us is with a positivistic education, we don't know what to do with the negative, right? So the negative is something bad or whatever. So um, that means, let me repeat again, what they call the utterly other or the totally other is not entirely empty, but it is the negative concept. We don't know the positive, but we know the negative. That this totally other, infinite, in means negation, negation of the finite. It is a negation of the finite. That means of finitude, of the curse of finitude, that you have to die, that you begin to dis disintegrate already when you're 30 years old, and so on. That negativity is negated. This totally other, this infinite, 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 is the negation of finitude, of appearances with all of their negativity, with all their injustices and so on. And that is not simply nothing, right? So, the Hegel's logic, and I don't know why Marx and these people didn't see that, it is a huge line of definitions of the absolute. The absolute is being, the absolute is nothing, the absolute is essence, and so on. That means these are steps until it comes to that the absolute is spirit, the absolute is idea, and so on. So the absolute is measure, the absolute is the measure of all things, and so on. So that means the whole thing is theology, but not in the way how you have it on television there, but uh, theology as Master Eckhart had it, theology as Thomas Aquinas had it, theology as Plato had it, theology as Aristotle had it, and not the watered-down thing for, for, for the catechism thing, right? But the content of the catechism is preserved there. It's only the form which is different, not the content necessarily. So how do you arrive at an actionable system of ethics from a negation of negativity in the totally other? Well, you, you would say, you know, that it is our task, for instance, to negate the negative wherever we find it. That means to overcome alienation to overcome the ab abandonment of people, the loneliness of people in the streets, and, and so on. Marxism, so, on. so the whole Marxism you can do, do, derive from it. The question is, you know, why do some people not have this longing, and so on? And there we have already in the Abitur, you know, the end of the high school, Marx writes a text that uh, I can bring it to you the next time where he says, you know, we all have this longing in ourselves. We have this divine spark in us. But then comes all the porno, all the greed and so on, and it suffocates it all. So therefore, they want to gather those people in whom that longing is not yet suffocated. And this longing for this totally other, which is the negation of the negativity, which is the truth, can be the basis of a morality. Now Habermas thinks you can have this morality without all uh, theology of any kind, you know. But when you see what he does, he starts out with language then. He says, when I talk about nature, I must be, I must be truthful. Why the hell do I have to be truthful? If I um, talk about my inner world, I must be honest. When I talk about the social world, I must be rightful. When I talk about art, I must be tasteful. And when I talk about the world of language there, I have to be understandable. And why should I be understandable? Why should I be honest and so on? Well, because if you're not, the discourse breaks down. That's it. That means you have to be ethical, because nobody will talk with you anymore. Bush. Nobody talks with him anymore. He lied the blue from the sky for too long. They forgive you one lie, but when you lie all the time, he would say, you cannot talk with this guy anymore. 
It was Iran. We have the president now wants to talk with Iran, you know. But it has been so poisoned, you know. And so on. They're liars over there. We are liars and so on, you know. They say they want to have atomic energy without weapons. They're liars, you know, and so on. And then the other side, you have this and weapons and so on. And you bombed people already. You killed 150,000 already. So and then it goes back and forth, you know. Now, what Habermas says is you have to become honest. You have to become truthful and so on. Why? Why? No God will punish you. See, that is why there is no motivation really with this eth ethics without theology. Because if you did not obey the laws of the Lord, you know, of, of Allah and so on, you will be punished. You were punished in this world. And when you never, were not punished in this world, you could be sure it would be in the other world. Judgment Day, you see. So the longing that the murderer may not triumph over the innocent victim is another form to say the longing for the totally other. And uh, that, yes, yeah, you have something. It's already turned very concretely into ethical. The longing that the murderer shall not triumph over the innocent victim, not, at least not ultimately. And in this, at least not ultimately, there appear images of Judgment Day in Judaism, in Christianity, Islam, but also in Buddhism, also in Hinduism, also in Taoism. But these images of Judgment Day have been negated, they are mythology, they are demythologized, but some of it, of what has been negated, is preserved. These images are preserved precisely through their negation. These images are preserved through their demythologization. That's dialectic thinking. When Hitler, when Hitler had a, 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 a dialectician before him, he just got outraged. <laughs> and he said, these guys are hopeless. I can make something clear at night to them, and in the morning they're all messed up again. And so, on. so when you have a positive mindset, and the dialectician, it is confusing. You can see the light for a moment, and then it disappears again, because the positivistic structure reappears again. That is the that case with all our students. inauthentic and hmm? dishonest about his view of the negativity of what Jews were doing? Like, if he was negating a negative aspect of society, then he's acting on the same ethical structure. Who who are you talking about now? Uh, we, you, you brought up Hitler, and I'm wondering oh, if oh, yeah. he, are we going to say okay. that I mean he was unethical? We're not talking about Habermas, now we're talking about fascist ethics, right? Fascist ethics was the principle of the aristocratic principle of nature. No, I'm, I'm interested in taking the negation of negativity system of ethics and asking whether Hitler was an ethical person. No, not by that measure, no. Hitler was an ethical person according to his own fascist ethics. And the core of the fascist ethics, as he pointed out in my struggle uh, already in the end of the second chapter, is the aristocratic principle of nature. That means that the stronger has a right over the weaker, the predator over the prey. Mm -hmm. And he would say, I have not arranged this. I'm not responsible that this happens in nature, and it happens in history too. He was a positivist. See, that's what really happens, right? Now comes the ethical conclusion. I have to make sure now that I will not be the prey, but that I am the predator and that my nation will not be the prey as they were in 1918 or something. And that my race, the Europeans, you know, which are threatened by the Africans and the Asians and so on, that they will not become prey and so on. And that threateningness would be a negativity to, to Hitler, right? Like, his fascist ethics yeah. gave him the tools that he needed to look at what was negative in the world and what he needed to do as a result of that which seems to me the same ethical structure as the negation of the negativity, which is the basis but of what... I, I told you this because I want to, to say what his God was like, you see. The God of Hitler rewar rewarded the strong and punished the weak. So the Germans were not strong enough in 1918 in the Somme uh, invasion, the Somme attack. Therefore, they lost. They were punished for their weakness. And then he came as a national leader in a national uh, revival, the strength and the power of the Germans and so on, 
we are not any longer prey, we will become the predators ourselves. Then he marches with 3 million people there in no, Russia and kills 27 million and then comes to Stalingrad, you know, and then Kursk, and there is beaten. And, be, and, and on the way, you know, you have things where SS divisions gave in to Russian divisions and he sent an emissary in this chaotic situation and they had 3,000 men standing there and they pulled all the decorations, iron crosses and so on, from their chest and the officers' uh, signs and so on and degraded them because they had been too weak. His God was adjusted to the negativity of the world. The God was as negative as the world was. The God did not negate the world. The God rewarded those who were most negative, namely the predators. And you have that here in television all the time. Economic predators, sexual predators, and so on, you know. But um, if you apply the system of ethics Yes. You are which system? Of, out which system of ethics? The negation of negativity and the holy other. If you take that yeah. system and you apply it to Hitler and his life, and Hitler becomes all wrong because he was inauthentic, he was dishonest. No, 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 or no, he no, wasn't no. Negating negativity. No, I mean, it is in the, in the positivistic thing that he took things, you know, as a, well, let's put it that way. You come from a Catholic background. There are two ways when we talk about the natural law. There are two ways to look at it. One is, we have to behave like they behave in nature. That's what Hitler said. So his understanding of negativity was wrong. No. Let's see, he was raised in a Catholic education. So he heard about the natural law. When he heard about the natural law, he thought, this is the law of nature. And what is the law of nature? That the predator mm -hmm. wins over the prey. What the Catholic Church meant was, nature as the essence of things, the, the notion of the family, you should act according to the notion of the family, the notion of the state, the notion of your being, of the human being, and so on. See, in one case, you have raw nature as it really exists. On the other hand, you have an idea of what things ought to be like. He canceled that Catholicism, that natural law, the old natural law tradition from the Stoics and Aristotle and so on and said, this is what I experienced in the trenches in France. Everybody kills everybody. And since they had the better weapons and so on, and were, were more courageous and so on, they won. God is on the side of the winner. God is not on the side of the loser. That turns upside down the whole New Testament God, who is for the poor and for the downtrodden, and he frees them and he liberates them, and so on, partially already, and so on. And, and Allah, too, uh, is, is caring for people and so on. So, but isn't he identifying a problem? And then... No, the problem, the only problem is... And so he wants to take that away. No. So he's negating a negativity, right? But there's a no. certain assumption already within critical theory that already identifies with negativity in terms of the Abrahamic traditions. So you have so to have a particularized notion of what it, negativity it, it, is. Certainly, certainly. It's not yeah. completely, you know, out there where it can go yeah. either way. Okay, let's... So in order to... It differs from, like, just being a faith. Well, let's be analytical in the well, sense that we keep apart fascist um, ethics, liberal ethics, socialistic ethics, Catholic ethics, and so on, right? So we have fascist euthanasia, and today we have liberal euthanasia. We have fascist eugenics, and we have liberal eugenics. Mm -hmm. How different are they? How similar are they? And so on. So, but what we have with Hitler is a man who was disillusioned about what the world is. So no idealism or all that he pushed aside, right? He also pushed Marxism aside. Marxism was bad because it was for the downtrodden. It wanted to liberate the fourth estate, the losers. It was on the side of the losers. He thought that if we would get rid of inequality between the classes, between the predators and the prey, and so on, the whole human species would disappear because all of nature is unequal. The cat is stronger than the mouse and the cat eats the mouse. That is the law in nature and that is the law also in history. And we have to conform to that law. And when the German armies were too weak, then they were bad. Too weak is bad. And then they were punished. As they were punished in 1917 already. He had provided leadership. He had called them up to be strong 
and predators and so on and to colonize Russia and so on and what did they do? They are too weak they withdraw when the Russians are coming not only the damned Italians there we are anyway but also because there are too much African blood in themselves but those Germans you know they had the real blood in themselves they should have stood up against that damned Slavic blood there of uh, you know underlings and so on so he had all planned it out beautifully a street to uh, Kiev and a street to Moscow and a street to Petersburg and it was organized in a network, a network with strong German farmers who were also soldiers and underneath thousands of Slavs who would do the work. Their birth would be controlled, like this here, you know, 2.1 children, and they would be fed well so that they could, uh, could work well, you know. But they would be the prey. And the predators would sit in the cities, there in this network, like a spider, and, and control them all. That is fascist ethics, right? So uh, the negative is weakness. He wanted to negate this weakness of the Germans. That is a negation of the negation, if you want to. But the Germans were too weak for that. And when they left in the trucks, you know, the German soldiers, and, and went to the West, Hitler and Goebbels saw this, and they said, what kind of people are this? They leave their women and children, you know, to be raped by the, by the Russian armies coming in. And the Southern Army did rape them. The Northern Army did not rape them, but that was the propaganda, that was the picture, and so on. And uh, so that shows the damned weakness, and he had felt no regret whatsoever. He said, you Germans, you, you had, we gave you the chance, going to Goebbels too, and you did not uh, take the chance. You showed that you were too weak. There is a negation of the negation in a certain sense, too, that the God is on the side of the strong, and uh, vanquishes or annihilates the weak. And that is the law of the world. So that's very different now from Marx or whatever. You know, Marx wants to have equality. The Old Testament, the bad name, I mean, the Hebrew Bible is for equality. But liberalism pays lip service to equality and then gives an equality of opportunity. That means the black Obama can get up there, but the 40 million stay in the slums. That means this, uh, the class system is not changed, you know. So liberalism and fascism, you know, and Catholicism have in common that they hate communists because communists are for equality. The Pope criticized the Castro and so on and communism in spite of the fact that he had communism in the beginning of the church. The parishes were communistic. They gave all property to people. And all the orders since the 4th century up to the present are all communists. And he criticizes communism being completely unaware of what he is criticizing. That is also pathology of spirit. You know. Okay, so, the, uh, so equality is a core word there which you can see. So, um, the, uh, the, 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 but, and, and you know, we don't want to simply to say those bad fascists or whatever. What is our experience now really, and, and the liberal experience, you know? Mm -hmm. When they, for instance, don't give health insurance to people except connected with the job, behind there there is a Protestant pessimistic anthropology. Human reason and will have not only been damaged, as the Catholics say, they have been practically destroyed. So people are lazy, people don't walk, want to work, and so on. Look for the Presbyterian, you know. He put 70,000 there under his control and he had thugs who went around in the factory halls beating people up if they went to the toilet too often or whatever. So there is a pessimistic anthropology behind that, you know. There, there are good industrious people, strong people, winners, and that's the 2%. And the others, the 47% or whatever Romney mentioned there, they are dependent and they will vote for Obama, etc. See, you have the whole thing there. Is it, I mean, but is it not really true? I mean, when you look around, are there not a lot of lazy people who do absolutely nothing, who do not collect their Social Security and then complain later on that they get only $1,000 or whatever because they worked only half their life and so on. See, that is the pessimism in liberalism. So, but we have to separate them. You know, we don't want to... That liberals, Catholics... And fascists hate communism and equality and so on. Does not mean that they're equal. They are very different. It would be bad logic to say this, you know. 
Rudy? So, yeah. It's quarter two. Do you want to? Yeah, we want to do that. Okay. okay. So we close that up. You have it the next time. You don't have to have it the next time. We have time enough for what you want to do that. We can really be flexible about the test. Take them home, look through, see what you want to do, and the next time we look at a few more of these questions, okay? And now let's look at this. Um, we are right on the theme. We talked about fascism. Now you see the guys, how what they really look like. And uh, for the political theorists, fascism is not only the past, it is a danger in the future. It's a possibility in the future. At the moment, by the way, the right wingers are very beaten, you know. Uh, but don't think they will remain beaten. They will wake up again. They will recover. Have we any comments? The, you know, the most difficult thing which we want to do here is to explain what that spirit means and why it is pathological and how one can heal it and so on because that concept has disappeared from our language and so the critical theory would do the, like to do the same thing like Christianity I remember all the time in our youth movement the fascist time we had some kind of a motto which said don't extinguish the spirit don't extinguish the spirit so that is a danger that people lose the concept and the reality at the same time. And that is exactly the core of what this pathology is all about. It's the pathology of a spirit which got lost or which got sick or which became like Narcissus or which became like Don Juan, which cannot go out to the other or cannot return from the other and so on. Now let's look what these guys look like there. Also little details of the movie there and how they put it, so it is somehow based on on a real document. You know, I really, this probably was filmed in the house. Yeah, and I gave a speech in a house opposite that on Wannsee ah. in, in Berlin there a few years ago. And the house is a Jewish house. Uh, they are very prosperous Jews, we talked about them. And uh, they expropriated it, took it away from him and made it a party, uh, a party house. Yeah, I went there just two years ago. You went into it, right? I took my students there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, I mean, Vance is a beautiful place. You know, on yeah. the lake there, all the boats are swimming around, and but uh, you make it louder. Starting World War Two. By the winter of 1942, his armies were freezing and starving in the snows of Russia, where his best general had died of a heart attack. Yeah, in front of Moscow there. Yeah. For the first time, Hitler's dream of a German empire to last a thousand years was in doubt. While he hired and fired generals, and the winter grew colder, 15 of his officials were ordered that to... That is the Fiesler Storch. It's a very small and slow airplane, and it's the purpose is artillery observation. So from there, you uh, inform the artillery and give them the measurement so they can shoot, right? Yeah, that is the house there. It's and that the on guy who bank. flies the plane is Heydrich. Heydrich is the chief who leads the whole thing. And uh, he was assassinated a few months later in a uh, park by insurrectionists. He, he drove around in an open car and they shot him. And Hitler said, why did this idiot drive in an in a, in a open car? My God, he was raged about this. See the German working class. The whole thing's a museum now. This is the guy whom you just mentioned. What is the guy who was hanged? Eichmann. Eichmann, yeah. Do we have enough? How many fell? I am sure we have a sight of the infantry, sir. Sure they all stole it from, from the Jews. I know, sir. Due to the working class, he has to pay for the whole thing. See, the fascists do something for the working class. Liberals do something for the working class. But one thing they do not do, and that is to be equal and dissolve the difference. All right, then. They all have beautiful uniforms. That looks smart. Working class people 
you know why they did not why. That's a little Volkswagen there, if you saw the Volkswagen was an imitation of Ford's T model, and then they changed it for the war. It had no water cooling, so it did not freeze in Russia.
grand entrance. Yeah. Eight of them had doctorates.
from all the uh, tensions up. this 
Okay, let's close up then. Okay, I'll have to go. Do you find your way out? Yes. Good. Correct.